Uh, no, we're live. We are live. Good. God, that took long enough. I think we're okay. I don't know what's going on. I think the internet's being a bit funny at my end, maybe. We've had some so issues I'm looking, today. I'm looking at a thing. It says waiting for Gareth Dennis. Yeah, it does say that, doesn't it? Why does it say that? We're live. We should be live. Um. Wait a minute, let me just copy this and... Oh, no, we are live, Gareth. Is it working? We're good? Yeah. Ah, good, we're here. What a strange start to a rail natter. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, good grief. Right. Oh, Dr. David Turner is here and just being so patient in the chaos. Uh, <laughs> I'm so it's sorry, fun. everyone. It's good. <laughs> It's been chaos. I don't even know how much of the description of chaos people have heard. Um, so, ah, oh, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. I know everyone's saying it's okay if we go over on time. No, because the whole point is if we focus, trying to focus on creating a nice, compact hour. Oh, I don't know what the stream delay is. Is it, um, is it really bad? Oh, it's about 30 seconds. So that's about normal. Okay, so we got the chat. I'm going to say, as ever, put it in... Uh, if you at me, I'll see your question. So if you if you at me in, um, or put yeah put at me into it, and I'll see the questions as they come up. Today we are talking about beaching. Are we talking about the man beaching? Are we talking about the thing beaching? Let's see. We shall wait and we shall see. Well, we shall wait and we shall see in about thirty seconds. Um, I'm going to get OBS back up so that I can actually control the production quality. We have. Dr. David Turner here. It's it's Dr. David oh. Turner week. <laughs> um, direct from London. Direct from London. Uh, in our London studio, Dr. David Turner, railway historian, um, and my very dear friend. Ah, oh, who, who was on? Um, who was watching? Uh, I know. Hello. Who was watching uh, Railway Architecture last night uh, and enjoyed Dr. David Turner coming up and telling us about beer and railways? For some of you, it might be familiar because David talked us through some of those things. I think in Rail Matter. Um, Back in episode yes, yeah. four, five, six, six? Five? Yeah. some of those numbers. Um, Karanki, we're in twelve already. We're smashing through the, the smashing through the double figures. Uh, next week mm -hmm. is thirteen. Ooh. Unlucky for some. Although technically, this is our thirteenth episode, so we had, you we've had the worst theory. start. We had the worst start of of any rail matter as the technology all fell to bits. So uh, yeah, thirteen. You know. Some lucky for some, right? Anyway, enough of this waffling. Uh, David is here. I don't know. Either, we don't have drinks, proper drinks. I've just got water. I don't even have a cup of tea. I've got an old I'm mug awesome. that I finished earlier, but that's no good to anyone. It's empty. Um, I've also got a cycle computer and a finished jar of honey. So uh, that's finished rather than finish. You know, these are the these are the. I, I have. Harry Gervish's official history of British Rail. <laughs> Excellent. Rally. So we're all set. Right, that's all we need. We're seven minutes in. I knew this would still go on, even though I thought it was going to be compact because it's taken about, I've spent about 15 minutes putting the slides together. Anyway, right. It's all about the chat. For starters, let's, let's let me line up my button pressing and say, welcome to Rail Matter. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny about this bit? David and I can't hear the music, but I know that I put Carmina Burana uh, <laughs> rather than not the normal I've done doing this. And um, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Carmina Burana there. In fact, the reason I put this hoodie on is because um, uh, I was singing in that performance of Carmina Burana. That was my first ever con concert performance at the Edinburgh University Music Society. So, um, yeah. Anyway, you're a singer, Garrett. Ah, sing baritone, yeah. Sing bass when needs oh. to. You know, at the end of a tour, second bass. Just at the start of a tour, maybe I'll skip up into tenor. Should get together and do a song. Yeah, anyway, so. anyway, yeah, we're here uh, to talk about uh, beaching, and we're going to start. I mean, we've we've done all the interest. So let's crack on with the slide, shall we, and see where we end up. So, uh, first of all. We're going to start with the news, or rather, we're going to start with last week's news. Um, 
Yeah, so this was the, week, the, the news last week that's kind of a continuing saga, really, of the current Department for Transport having, having a bit of a, or, or rather the current administration, shall we say, having a bit of a fixation with the idea of reversing beaching as a force mm. for good. Now, um, as, as a few of you might have noticed, I railed about this when they first announced the money because they announced £500 million. Now, that £500 million, was, some of it was for studies, but, uh, but they, they were making out and all the press releases were suggesting that £500 million was there to re start reversing beaching cuts. And I pointed out that for £500 million, you're going to get yourself about 25 miles of railway. And beaching alone allegedly chopped about 5,000. So... I mean, a drop in the ocean doesn't quite do that justice. But I thought I'd bring this slide up because it, it just shows a lot of the... And we're going to get into this discussion, and, and I don't know what order we're going to talk about these things, but there are lots of ideas related to beaching as an aura, right, right, David? Yeah, I mean, the fact that they use beaching... And you, and, and you, you made the mistake there as well. You said beaching cut. when well, he didn't cut a thing. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll probably get on to this later but it was the ministry and the government that cut the lines um so yeah so the but the, the fact that you use that that phrase t almost tells you much how easy it is yeah, to slip so into easy. yeah and i try and rabbit ears it every time i do but i'm not going to be able to rabbit ears it as much as I, i'd like to in this presentation exactly. but i think I, I think the idea of what beaching means now to people i should have put a picture of people in red coats from zulu up later in a slide we'll come back to that thought remind me david um mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> spoilers but you can see some of the names they're picking out names that mean nothing to the general public yeah like reinstatement of the ivanhoe line how many people do you think what percentage of people in britain know or care what that means let alone uh, the fact that it's inaccurate because the trains are running on it and all these other things but references to things like the waterside line what what does that mean no yeah. one knows what these line names mean anymore it just shows how much firstly they're appealing to a very narrow you know a narrow aspect of society, a kind of portion of society but also how how meaningless the suggestion of uh, rabbit ears reversing beaching really is and i mean you've got to wonder about sort of you know how many things were throw, thrown out because well just oh this would be a nice idea because we once had a branch a branch line or a railway line absolutely and yeah, yeah. and i yeah and it, right okay let, let's let's next slide this one because i think yeah so so this whole presentation is not we're not going to talk in detail about lines that you want me to reopen or that you think should reopen all mm. the people who are on the chat right now who think that and want that to be what this is, is about um on there's going to be another rail matter in the not too distant future, which I'm going to, which is going to be titled something like a guide to better crane easting, which is where we'll talk about the idea of reopening lines, or rather, what I like to say is, don't think about reopening lines. Think about where we need new lines, and if there happens to be a bit of old railway line on that corridor, great, make use of it. But we need to get out of the idea of reopening old railway lines for the sake of it, because it, frankly, the country's different, and we're going to get to that. So this whole presentation, this whole chat, this whole rail matter is actually going to be about, inverted commas, reversing beaching mm -hmm. and how meaningless that is. And maybe some of the other myths related to beaching uh, and some of the enemies, uh, beaching as an idea. Uh, and we're going to maybe de kind of um, do a, a scooby-doo on a few of the baddies in this process and how perhaps they weren't the baddies that, that we all think they are. Um, anyway, right. So reversing beaching, what does that mean? So here's a nice big orange... Uh, image with screen. nothing on it it's a nice big orange screen i'm going to shove up the these were the beaching the beaching cut mm. uh proposals as part of well okay tell you what let's let's get our faces side well, side by side dr david turner tell me what what this thing the inverted commas beaching cuts what what were they tell us about so it, it was a it was a, a report uh well so towards the end of the 1950s the idea of uh the idea of closures on the large scale. So railway closures have been going on since, well, even the First World War. About 1,200 miles of British railway line were closed in the interwar period, and there's some good evidence to suggest, or one academic has, has made the case that, say, so companies like the London Northeastern Railway, which were you know, struggling in the interwar period, uh, despite what the propaganda might say, 
should have been more proactive in closing railway lines because some of these lines were just, uh, you know, you get a drop off, a, a decimation by buses in the interwar years. Move towards the post-war period, there's about 3,000 uh, miles cut in the 1950s. I think that's about right. And what you get a move, you get the modernization plan, which is a, a so I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be clear here now that a lot of this come what I'm going to say tonight comes from my reading of, of Charles Loss' very good work which I'd recommend to everybody Terry Gurvish's Dudley and Richardson's I don't study this period myself but I do teach it um, I study the earlier period but the the argument that is made by Charles Loft is that what you get in the night 1950s and late 1950s is a sense that the modernization plan, which was a political tool, it's, it's, it's a way to subsidize British rail uh, railways when, so the government really didn't want to intervene in into sort of, sort of to be seen to be subsidizing the state nationalized industries. So it's a way to, subsid, to address concerns over labor relations and pay without having, and BR's deficit was huge was significantly growing uh, without actually having to um, to inv- you know directly subsidize yeah, so yeah. Oh, the, the prospect of modernization would bring the railways to sur- you know surplus and this doesn't really work and it goes through a couple of reappraisals the modernization plan is arguably a bit of a mess and in the late 50s this idea this genesis of the idea or the sort of emergence of a stronger idea of closure comes on the fore and then in 1963 you get this report published um, by dr beach and we'll go into we'll unpack that and this proposed the closure of a massive swathe of um it's 5,000 miles, 2,300 yeah, stations. It, it, and the clear thing is it proposed. And what actually was proposed was not carried through. Mm-hmm. A lot of what was proposed was not carried through. There were lines that were closed that were not in the report, and there were lines in the report that um, sorry, that weren't closed. Yeah, so, so there was, which shows, I mean, even on that level, it shows that there was a huge amount of governmental politics at play, local politics at play. So the idea mm. that the technocrat who was beaching had come up with this list, he'd, he'd offered the information mm. with, with, okay, there are all the arguments about Dickey surveys and all this stuff. Yep, fine, I'm sure there were. But the reality was, I think he had a fairly short period of time to collect a lot of data. He made the so, proposal and then government had, had to do, the ministry and government at large had to do something. So, so we'll, we'll go into the details of sort of, I'm sure we'll touch on it. But, but that's, you asked me what the fundamentals were, yeah. and then we get this closed approach. Yeah, process. yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's worth pointing out. So this, the, the modernization plan was uh, it kicked off in 1955, was a huge multi-billion even then pound investment in the railway, in the British railway network. Post-war, it's falling to bits. The idea was this modernization plan would be like a rocket up the backside to just magically modernize it. And it was, cat- I, 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 you don't have to say this because you're more bound by academic rigor. I can say that it was a catastrophe. It was very little good came out of it at all. There were a few points of light, but it was just a mess. You know, well, the, the, the idea of commissioning huge pump, uh, hump marshalling yards, for example, massively expensive infrastructure for bulk loads in little two-axle wagons that, that ceased to exist a few years later. You know, it's... Yeah, I mean, part of the dimension to that is that it's not... It's, it's something that, like, BR is pulling things that have been... Some of the sort of ideas for them have been, genus, you know, before... The Second World War, you know, mm. so it it is a lot of it, it's a very complex question because the 1955 report is not a plan. A plan is, is being generous to it. Yeah, yeah. it's a collection of ideas that they thought would over 20 years solve the problems to bring BR back to um, solvency, mm. and uh, it 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 did have some good things out of it, but what it did. And it's not entirely BR's fault, I think, you know, you could, I'm not so in favour of Charles Loft in saying that it's, it, you know, it's much more of a political failing because it wasn't monitored mm. or, it, 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 you know, it wasn't, it didn't receive the ministerial rigour um, for some reason. I think I've got his argument there. Uh, there were managerial failings within BR. 
um, partly in, 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 sort of in response to the 1953 Act, which yep. decentralised BR. But um, sorry, there's something going on now. Um, but I think I think that there is there is this plan that was it was quite rushed. It was quite, and then you have two reappraisals, and, and by the there's a reappraisal in 1959, which actually is 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 whimsical. You know, this yeah. keeps setting the time frame back. It's done by BR, and the Treasury looks at it and goes, "Well, that ain't gonna work." Yeah. You know, you're 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 in fairyland here. Yeah. So. It is it is serving a political role because the the government in the 1950s is using the railways as a handmaidens of other. This is a phrase uh, that is frequently to handmaidens of other um, policies to say keep prices. So you control railway rates and you control prices, control weight or sort of reduce industrial unrest. You you know control control things in that domain as well. So. The railways are being sometimes being used in that way, yeah. um, ministerial intervention. So we'll, we'll get. I'm, I'm digressing. No, no, no. It's good. Well, this this whole you know rail matter is just one long digression, isn't it? So um, two things. The first is um, the. In fact, I'll tell you what. We'll do David Shearer's question first. So David Shearer's uh, is pointing out and querying. Wasn't it the case that at the time? Um, so in the run-up to Beeching, but also at the time of the modernisation plan, I agree, it wasn't a plan at all. Um, BR was a common carrier, and it, so it theoretically had to carry this uh, small wagon load traffic. Uh, so there's, yeah. there's two two problems. Yes, it was. This is, a, this is actually a rule that goes back to 1854, so it's 100 years old. It's, it's quite problematic in the interwar years. Um, the, problem, the problem with that is that you need, in some dimension, to be able to be a common carrier. So it's still dominant on bulk freights like coal, but if BR was acting in any truly purely commercial sense, it would that that traffic is earning marginal profits, probably sometimes at a loss. Uh, but you need coal. This is a period where people's houses are pitted in coal. They would go and do so. You know that that would go. Uh, but the other side of that coin is a lot of people were not using. The railways. I, mean, I think it's sometimes not appreciated how much uh, traffic has been taken off the railways, even in the mineral sector, by the road haulage mm. industry. And in part, again, that's because of restrictions on BR had to, well, I don't know if BR did, but the Interval Railways definitely had to publish their rates and put them at stations. Um, and So they could actually just so be undercut, could they? By... They could be undercut. Really but interesting. The, the thing is, once you get to the post-war period, like if you take major companies, they're transferring to road. And after the D, D you know, so the railways, sorry, the British Transport Commission 48 also was going to try and nationalise all, you know, road haulage of certain licence categories. I think that's right. Um, and it didn't happen. And then there was sort of selling off those. The lorry sector grows and grows. So... Yeah, it's got to be common carrier in one dimension, but at the same time, actually, that's not making much of a difference in the yeah. other dimension. And they should—they so, should really have scrapped it. They should have scrapped. They should have lobbied for government to scrap the, the common carriage element in there. Well, just... before, the, before the Second World War, the, the, the railways do get a degree of acceptance of that when they're more—they're still a competitive force. Mm. Uh, or could be much more of a competitive force. I should clarify: different companies, different. Um, they they lobby through a campaign in 1938 called the Square Deal for the reduction and re re reducing of all these um, things. But um, yeah, perhaps it should. I I don't necessarily disagree. I think if you look uh, just before the Second World War, a third of all goods. Uh, of, of all um, goods now going by road, uh, including minerals. So the road. Yeah, so it's already you're already seeing that drop off in uh, in, yeah. in carriage. Yeah. So um, right, conscious, we've already managed to get to 23 minutes past seven, which is great. It's good. We've done, well, it's just interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting topic to discuss, and and this isn't going to be the last rail matter discussing this overall theme because there's just so yeah. much to unpick. Um, Oh, so the other thing I was going to say is you've, in terms of the, and this comes to, in fact, I'll tell you what, let's wait for trends and I'll talk to you about trends because I know you've done a lot on interwar 
or you've discussed interwar trends quite a bit. Oh yeah, interwar. Yeah. I, I think that's relevant. It's really relevant because the, the war, the Second World War, really it just freezes every, it freezes everything. But actually, all the trends in running up to the Second World War continue after you know continue mm. afterwards once that military you, traffic dissipates. You can trace them back to the before the First World War. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So um, well, let's go. Let's go presentation Something. again. So um, the, his proposals were. So what he put in reshaping Britain's railways it, it involved that scale. But actually, if you look in total, the total loss, and this is from, so basically this is the, the really, this is the net reduction in network from its peak mm -hmm. to its uh, lowest point. So um, the lowest point was in the 80s, I think. And the highest point was in the 1910s, I believe. That probably accounts for some of the new bits that opened up in the early 1900s. But there wasn't much really at that point. In any case, you went from over 20,000 miles down to, well, to be honest, yeah, down to just under 10,000 miles. Yeah. I think we've got 9,000 or something miles of railway left now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can see there was a lot more to the reduction of size of the UK railway network than the inverted commas beaching. Mm -hmm. and if it's any, well, I mean, the thing is, beaching, beaching cuts, I'm going to, you know, doggy it anymore. Um, go into the 70s and you know they, they they it's but how far from the the report do you classify as you know so it's but as i said closures were going on before beaching and in fact a considerable amount about the same amount was closed on the pre-beaching days mm. uh, as in you know just in the years after so it's it, it's almost like saying beaching was the point at which there was an appreciation of cuts is yes. actually not the case whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like just a continuation, really. Um, so David Shepard asks an interesting question, which I think we'll maybe, maybe we'll get on to shortly. Uh, David has asked, how many of the tweaks to the beaching plan were down to people shouting enough to scare the government away from closing specific stations? If you haven't got an answer to that one immediately, I think we can get on to chat about it later. But do you have any immediate thoughts on that, David? Well, it's it's to to give you one answer to a, a national picture is uh, quite yeah uh, interesting, and we'll get on to the fact that hardship and things there's a there's a sort of narrative that hardship wasn't considered well, it was, um, and the campaigns generally did not i think i think there's something to be said for people screaming and shouting but a lot of political concerns come in regional planning concerns stuff like that a lot of plant beaching was convinced not to include some london lines mm. in the plan even though though so that immediately there you've got a um a consideration of local concerns there's also the development of planning systems that also impinge on on so there's all these factors inside government that are determining the nature of a yeah. uh, nature of cuts sometimes and as, um, with, as with any project because it was you know the development of the, of the the report was a project as with any project it, the, the output is only ever as good as the quality of the scope so if you have a, sc a scope that's pretty fuzzy but you don't have much time to to, to mm. sort of shore that up as a, as a client in this case the the, the british railways board um you're going to have areas that seem like they've paid more attention to the long-term needs of a, of a region compared to others. But we're going to get mm. on to... So I think if we skip on to the next slide... Here we go. Right. This picture... It's a picture paints a thousand words, right? Yeah. Um, so all... And actually, these maps aren't quite right. I think there are some mistakes in, in either. But they give a general feel... General the change yeah. in network from, from kind of... As, as we've said, 63, which is when the report was published, the, the Beeching report, 63 is probably about the midpoint of the, 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 line, the, the rate of line closures. And I've got a graph that I literally created three minutes or two minutes before the, we went live, which I think shows the trend, um, yeah. uh, hopefully, which is in here if it hasn't broken. Uh, but you can see that there are major gaps, and those gaps have fallen on the regions. So... Hmm. Glasgow actually didn't do too badly, but has has some pretty major cuts. Um, London does not suffer many cuts at all. The regions yeah. broadly suffer huge cuts, particularly Scotland, particularly rural Wales. But actually, the areas but, that are most hit are um, the Scottish borders, 
and the northeast of Scotland. Those are the two areas that really suffer the most. And the thing is, you know, in the 70s and the, and the, and the uh, particularly when you, you get more government coming, you know, more, more sort of sense of region, regionalism in government, there's more, you know, you get, uh, it, 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 you tend to get more pushback from, say, the Scottish minister or the Welsh minister, more political dynamics involved in there that push against um, further closures. There is threats to further closures in these places. Yeah. Actually, the, in the 70s, the political scenario changes somewhat, which makes progress, closure progressively harder. And I suppose the pinnacle of that is to settle to Carlisle, yeah. which is an intractable fight, and it's not closed. So from the 60s onwards, it becomes harder because of we, local political uh, concerns to close lines in government. Uh, there is, you know, there, there is a reluctance to alienate uh, voters, especially in these places where there, there's, you know, might be marginal seats and, you know. So I think, I think it's, it's interesting that 80 format well, actually, the, 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 what, what beaching does and what beaching, I think, is one of the interesting things about beaching is it stopped almost because of the closures in the 60s and 70s. It almost stops the conversations about, slows the conversations about closures to an extent that the network was stabilized at a point, it, you know, and, and it's it's well, what's, hasn't really from, from the, I mean, with with things early, you know, some tweets and whatever. From the eighties, the network size didn't really change. Mm. Right, uh, and, it, and it's interesting that, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I and mean, there's so much that gets discussed, so much baggage on this. And I'm seeing lots of chat in the, uh, you know, a huge yeah. amount of chat going on. Everyone discussing all sorts. Um, David Shearer's asks what percentage of all closures were beaching closures. I think maybe a third Ooh. could be pinned into the. The report. That's, that's something I don't know off the top of yeah, my head. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think broadly it's about a you can a, but, a pin about a third of the overall closures to the that came directly out of uh, the yeah, report. Yeah, it's so hard because but it's, it is difficult. Yeah, did you argue that actually beaching was a so again going back to Charles Loss' work? Uh, it, it, it's quite he calls beaching a snapshot. He calls it uh, a snapshot. Of work in progress so yeah. there is uh, a, a sense that beaching didn't look at other matters it didn't look at transport but that that is actually complete opposite of what beaching wanted beaching it, there was a committee called the special advisory group in 1960 and it's usually held up um, henshaw's railway conspiracy uh, which i recommend to my students to read because I, i'm not to i'm not to shape their opinions i do not think that it's a book which it sets out with the premise that there was conspiracy and tries to. That's my view. However, um, it's usually held up because it was secret. Um, it was secret. The, the findings were secret. It was held up. Oh, it was planning for closure and, you know, it was an underhand. Well, it was secret because it was an embarrassment to the government. Yeah. There were riffs inside it. They didn't want it out. Uh, Beeching and this other chap. Uh, clashed with the other two individuals on it and uh it it was um it was yeah it was it was a, it, w it wouldn't have sat well and my concern over henshaw's argument is that this is all revealed in terry gilvich's 1986 history of british railways and then henshaw repeats the thing in a later edition more recently so it's it's that's a concern over his argument but Beaching is pushing in that for, for a holistic study of what the railways do, what transport does, how transport works. Um, and that's part of the broader, should we say, a broader development of transport policy and thinking, modernization of transport policy. Again, this is Charles Loft's argument and thesis, a broader appreciation of transport policy in this period. And one of the issues here is if you think about the railways get taken over by the state in 1948. There is a reliance on the railways up to that point. And after the modernization plan, the Treasury starts going, well, hang on here. This is this is problematic. Where are the figures? Where is, you know, can you justify the figures? And 
in, in line with what's going on generally with the nationalized industry, it's on the National Coal Board, it starts to modernize its, its sort of planning and thinking. And around transport policy and the ministry starts sorry the ministry starts to do that as well yeah. the ministry of transport so this is not a situation where they would have perfect knowledge and actually beaching turns around to br and goes where are all these figures and br yeah. just doesn't, doesn't have them and the statistical problem of british railways and what statistics be, uh, british railways collect and how they collect them and and what they tell tell people is a debate that's been going back to the 1890s but the railways i think didn't collect the information Beeching needed. And so what you get, and it's it's sort of knocked off by the presentation, which is to present it as a technocratic finished product to, should we say, overcome political yeah, image yeah. issues. But actually it's a snapshot of work in progress. Um, and this is why you get that notorious survey, which says, oh, well, uh, we were here and people said, well, you didn't count the summer months. Uh, well, Beeching was on a, a you know, he, he was under a political sort of, he needed to get it done. He yeah, yeah. Get it done in time. Uh, but also, uh, oh, the point about that is if you've got some places which earn half their revenue in two weeks, it still doesn't mean the line is making a profit. Yeah, yeah. Not, no, it's not even the work. But not even the benefit of funding it is enough to... You know what I mean. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and this, this, this comes back to a major issue the railways had. In fact, our first ever evening where we met, we chatted about data management and data collection. And it was in the context of the railways, the, I think it was the LNWR, actually, that we talked about data collection and the fact that it might have been the I can't. It was one of the railways that you know very intimately well. And the, the Northeastern Railway was um, uh, very enamoured with American statistics mm. uh, it's held up as a leader tom mile it developed tom mile which railways didn't generally keep um well, they, the didn't keep anything. they were just they were just useless with data but like broadly like there were a few points of light i said the NER, but by and large but the, the, the theory the behind that rubbish. Is you've got the, in the period when you've got this this data needs to be processed through thousands upon thousands of clerical stuff mm. by the time you've got the statistics they're actually for day-to-day decision making they're not very that was the argument we you know i'd like a bit more research on this but yeah you know the argument was that they're useless mm. yeah I'm not really sure where so, i stand so you've now. got bad statistics that aren't well kept uh that aren't necessarily that useful so there's no incentive to manage that data set anyway um and frankly you know employing the clerical staff to to manage that data set wouldn't have been worth it, it its time you know, we're in a different world now where it's very easy, you know, Excel spreadsheets can pile mm-hmm. up as much as you like in a cent, you know, in, in Great Minster House. Um, yeah. But I that mean, fed so into the so idea much, that... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that just fed into the idea, the problems that... Uh, and the snapshot idea is very... I think that's a really key one. And it, it, that, I think that feeds into the conclusion of this whole piece. Um, but the, but the, the, thing, the thing with this is that um, the Ministry of Transport uh, is, is at the, these... At these periods, they are. This is this is the problem with with this whole whole discussion on beaching. It's not to do with transport. It's sometimes a lot of the time to do with what happened to the railways. Yeah. And one of the things the Ministry of Transport is trying to do in this period is get a handle on transport trends and transport flows, and transport developments. Now. What do you do as a ministry when you've got car usage is skyrocketing, yeah. motor lorry usage is skyrocketing, and you're tr- you'd start pr- trying to predict these figures in nineteen the late fifties? So, so I've, what's this? So I've just popped up. Um, uh, I've just popped up some trends. Now these are trends from nineteen fifty to, to to this year. Um, I think my numbers are, I haven't got last year's numbers in here, but this gives you an idea of the trends. And I think it's really important to see these trends. So th- this, this is two, two sets of trends. Um, Matt Reed's asking about how much money was saved by all the lines cut. I have no idea, well, but... I mean, I, it, 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 BR's financial situation did not improve. Yeah. yeah. Uh, w- wage increases in the 1960s um, certainly pushed up 
the the costs to roughly the same you know you know yeah. i don't think it had a significant but it, it's the argument is would it have been worse if yeah, that's yeah, a counterfactual yeah. I, I can't answer. that's a can yeah it's, it's counterfactual is very difficult to to think about so so two trend graphs here that i'm going to show in fact just just the one and i'm going to break down so this one so you've in red at the top you've got roads modal share Mm -hmm. uh, at the bottom in thick blue, you've got rails modal share. And you can see from 1950, basically, it's a downward trend. And in fact, it is continues to be a downward trend. Or is that both? Or that's is everything. That... So that's just uh, overall modal share. So of everything, passenger and freight, the whole works. The, these are the national statistics. And you yeah. can see that air is just climbing throughout. Rail drops, and it only really reaches a midpoint in 95 in terms mm -hmm. of its modal share. So that's not necessarily yeah. passengers. We do, I do have one about passengers uh, shortly. But mm -hmm. if you just think about modal share, I've zoomed in on 1952 to 1965 here. Yeah. So this is a bit more I mean, of the time scale that the politicians are looking at. And all they're seeing is a decline in rail. That's the context. It's well, really important. I mean, the, a lot of the 50s passenger numbers sort of hold up quite well. Um, but I think, I think with the... The start of the de I mean, if you were to project this backwards, the start of the decimation starts in, in the interwar years. It's I I, I recently got some um, I recently got my hands on these this data set in the National Archives, and it's the northeastern area of the London Northeastern Railway, and it's how you know it gives you every piece of data you would no actually it doesn't, but it gives you a lot of data that is really interesting, like passenger sales. Ticket numbers, tickets collected, freight, you know, all, all of it. And some of these branch lines um, uh, are, so 1919, they're carrying 20, 30,000 people. By 1938, they're carrying two, you know, they're, they're taking 2,000 tickets. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the opening up of bus routes. But from these statistics, and Butterfield, there's a track called Butterfield that actually went to work. I'm working on them in a different way, but he went to work on them in, in, in a different way. And he worked out that in 1938, seven northeastern districts are earning 50% of the revenue from those stations. There are 500 odd stations, and seven are earning all the revenue. Yeah. So the patterns you see that come out in the Beeching report are actually replicated by 1938 in, in the case for where we have the statistics. So let's, you know. so let's quickly jump back now to the, this graph that I very rapidly made because it says chart title at the top there. You can see really pro. Um, and uh, this is a graph from 1900 to the present day. I don't know why it goes up to 2036 at the bottom. As I said, I made this in about a minute and a half uh, before <laughs> the slide started. Um, and you can see that there's a bit of a climb from 1900 and the data starts getting a bit more dense from around about the Second World War onwards. And you can see that, 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 that it's already dropping through the, from the 27, you can see is about the peak and then it's dropping away. Then there's this yeah. rapid drop and that rapid drop does not start in 1963. Annoyingly, the numbers at the bottom aren't very usefully positioned, but you can see the start, the, the drop off really starts in the late 50s, mm -hmm. a really steep drop off. So, yeah. so, um, and then it and then it slows. It doesn't stop. In fact, there's a bit of a statistical weirdo in about 2003. I don't know what that little pitching <laughs> drop is. It doesn't make any sense. So um, ignore that. I think it's a it's a re statistical recalculation without without any sort of correction. But um, certainly, you can see that that the closure of lines slows uh, through the 60s until the start of the 80s, where it's yeah. it's pretty much flat at that point. And the political uh, energy. The, cap the capital has been no, spent by both sides of the houses and the energy goes out of the idea of closing railways. Yeah, I, I think it's... The other thing is, I mean, let's let's not um, sort of just... I think it's important to recognise that there is a report that is released uh, in the same year as Beeching called the Buchanan Report, also commissioned by Marples and also is trying to get to grips with the transport. It's called Traffic in Town and it's dealing with the transport problem. Both of these reports are the ministry trying to get to grips or are re reflective of the ministry trying to get to grips with transport policy and transport, you know, trying to understand how we project, how we think about transport. And, you know, and what happens, what this report actually does is how is the, how is the motor car going to disrupt our social way of life? And 
those sort of feelings that the car is actually not a good thing. I mean, let's be clear, many people saw it as a, a, a liberation, a, a symbol of modernity, a status symbol, and loved their cars. They also might have loved the railways, but they loved their cars. Mm. Um, but this sort of sense that the car is a, a slight problem actually starts to develop in some, to some extent in the 70s. And the 70s is really when you start to get the environmental movement coming through as oh, well. We've got a slide on that, yeah. Yeah. So, so the, it, the, the life is stuck, stuck, sucked out of, of the closure momentum, in part because of that, in part because it becomes harder, in part because of a you know, range of factors. Uh, in the political environment. Yeah. So, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to push us on to... Right, okay, I'm just going to remind myself what's going on. Okay, so firstly, as a local zoom-in, so we've got this map, let's zoom in locally to the northeast of Scotland where I grew up, and you can see the extent to which... And yeah. this isn't even all the stations, these are just the major stations. All the things in white there are the things that were closed. And actually, yeah. there are quite a few large towns there, but... And if I skip forward to this map, and this just shows England because I couldn't find a mm. decent image of scotland this map shows depopulation yeah it shows that there are bigger things at play than just the railway to just the narrow field of view of the railway and this is something that we all need to get better at in the railway it's uh, really um fascinating actually because urbanization has been a feature from before the railways i mm. mean you can trace it back right even into the 18th century and maybe even before but and and, and when the railways came to more rural areas it actually stopped out migration or it slowed it at very, mm. you know. But yeah, this sort of movement towards cities and, um, should we say, uh, this was the southeast, the sort of drift of the population, you know, the, the economic activity towards the southeast is evident in the 60s as well. Of course, it's it's pronounced much to a much greater degree now. But the the number of people living in rural districts declined um so yeah and uh, undoubtedly had a had a role to play yeah. in reducing traffic Brit figures Br Brit britain was changing it was a changing nation and and, yeah. and and it's not like this is you know one forcing the other there'll have been an extent of railway traffic freight traffic reducing a little bit so you know companies running fewer passenger trains so local areas change you know it's such a complex network of feedback mm -hmm. it's not just all oh, depopulation closed railways or vice versa you know this is a hugely complex web but the most important thing is it's not just about railways there's a bigger world going on and actually okay so we'll come back to that slide and ah. we'll go to this one here i'm going to go back to this, this order is dreadful but the point being uh, yeah. here is this is the m1 i think yeah um mm. here is a motorway and this was seen as the future yeah, so, I, I, I think I think there's a sort of sense of one of the things that people sometimes, you know, they, they say Marple's the road builder, and he was. Um, he was Marple Zurichway was his company. Yeah, now, there he is. He there he is. He looks wild. He, 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 was, he was a... He was a, he, he had he was a bad, in, crooked man, but actually in this particular well, theatrical setting... OK, so he, he was bent for a variety hope, of reasons, but in this, in this that's context... That's sort of suave, you know, go-getter, I'm yeah. a doer, I'm a... But he had not received any payment from Marple's Ridgeway since 1951. Um, and he sold his shares on becoming Minister of Transport. Now, he tried to sell them initially in a way... That would allow him to get them back after he left office. Now, again, I'm quoting from, I'm, I'm going to go back to Loft here. He says, the problem was seeing that as a sort of dodgy dealing. So we, we know he had some dubious dealings after he left, uh, I think. Um, but the problem with that is he had no inherited wealth or no wealth to fall back on. So it his argument, Loft's argument is, it's not unsurprising that initially he tried to do that, to, to get, in a way, sell back his shares. Yeah. Long short of it, he sold them off. Actually, that's not really very important. Because the minister before, which I think was Wilkinson, Wilkinson, he had already initiated a massive motorway building, yeah. road building program, when Marples ascends to the, or oh, ascends, <laughs> yeah. the position, rises to his throne, the, transport, yeah. the uh, ministry is 
already is at that point pushing for 60 million road building program and increasing it to 90 million. And that's big money. In today's money, that's, you know, that's, we're talking Even about sort football. of hundreds of millions of pounds. So, yeah, Marples was an enthusiastic road builder, but people were buying cars. There was a, a you know, huge congestion. This is the period where predict and provide comes through. There's yeah. huge congestion. Road building is a vote winner. Yep. And this is recognized from the mid 50s. And, you know, you get the M1. So, I'm not convinced that if you'd had a different Minister of Transport in there, you'd have a significant... You might have had less um, forthrightness. You might have had less uh, enthusiasm or reduce. But I still think you'd end up with a massive road building yeah. program. Much um, as it's, it's popular to... So I put this up. To, to, these are the two demons. <laughs> of the, they're the two demons of the piece. Um, and neither... And there's a huge conspiracy about Marple's. He was mm. he was a, a corrupt politician later on, but I do not think even if a different minister, I agree with David's uh, thinking on this. That if, even if there'd been another minister there, I think we'd been ex yeah. in exactly the same position. Um, and I, and, and I Marples, think, there know, wasn't a conspiracy. The the idea, you know, the whole of the British public. The reason I put the motorway picture up, this was seen as the future by most people. And I think you've yeah, said, David, also, you've used the phrase, if you ask people if they like the rail, if, you know, what they think of the railways, they say, oh, I like the railways. And then if you ask them, do you, well, do you take the train? They go, oh, no, I drive everywhere. It's as mm. true today <laughs> as, as it was. And, and I think and you I, use that to describe the interwar years, in fact. Um, and but, also on top of that, in the, in the 19, um, sort of under the Labour government, there is also another massive plan for road building. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not a, uh, a particularly sort of conservative no, thing. No, it isn't. It's well, they, they, they see it as, it's... at the time, Labour see it as, and the unions see it as modern work for their, for their yeah. construction, so that the construction I mean, unions see it as positive, you know, the general workers union. They all see it as... Well, they, they were one, they had a representative in the cabinet and they were, they were very against anything that subsidised rail. Uh, sorry, in the 1964 cabinet, uh, the Labour mm. cabinet. Um, they were against anything that, you know, subsidised rail. I mean, they didn't win out, and, and that's perhaps for a, you know, it, it's an interesting... It, and the Labour Party was, in a lot of cases, pro-rail. But it's not an uncontested political divide. It's not yeah. a... And also, you know, the Minister for Transport that comes in initially continues the closure process because there's things in train that you can't easily, you know... Uh, can't easily stop because of the legislative process. He cannot easily reopen lines mm. because, you know, legal, you know. Um, and also trying to get that balance that Marples and the Ministry were trying to get between where do you invest? How do you invest your, um, how do you invest your money in terms of future traffic patterns, future traffic goes? Those problems hadn't gone away by 1964. It was still an issue and of course, in a lot of cases, if you've got a branch line that's used by certain people and hardship is going to be caused by its closure, there is a thinking sometimes in government that, OK, so we can close this branch line and cause hardship. But if we could re-divert that money elsewhere, how much hardship, yeah, you know, really can mitigate that hardship mm -hmm. in other ways. And, and so again, totally up. fundamentally is seen as a way to stimulate economic growth, but also show modernization modernization is a big political theme in the conservative government and it's the railways are a sort of symbol not of that as well yep. so yep uh, Matt Reed asks this continues in, into the labor period as well yeah so, yeah what, and oh, well, it continues right the way through the 70s you know Matt Reed asks were ro was road seen as the better form of transport back then yeah People yeah. travelling around in little individual pods. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? You look at all of the sci-fi, all of the imagery of the future through this period, and it's all of individual people in individual pods on things that broadly look like, look like motorways. Mm -hmm. The I future think, was think... seen very much like this. Individual pods pulling people around in all directions. Um, this is the Hyperloop future. You know, Hyperloop is, is, is not a form of mass transit. It's a form of moving individual pods around. Autonomous vehicles are exactly the same vaporware futurism that that caused a lot of the problems uh, mm. in the past but at the time to a much greater extent than now the these individual pods were seen as the future well, individual I, pods I being the other, thing, the other thing is the the broader context and i'm gonna 
uh, my good friend Thomas Spain has written a lot on this, um, and Lawrence Black at the University of York. Uh, they released a chapter, but Thomas's thesis is particularly good. It shows that it's not simply about you know the, the the car, the motor car. It's about the lorry. It's about the fact that you've got the rise of the consumer society. Uh, in a, you know the consumer society keeps we keep pushing it back. You know consumers have existed since that infinitum, but there's sort of mass you know rising incomes, full employment of this period. You get the emergence of supermarkets. Now that what that does is that shifts governance. We've talked about governance before. Go read Thomas's thesis; it's available online. But he talks about the idea that it shifts governance in supply chains away from producers to consumers. In, in when we're talking supermarkets and food, uh, sorry, fr from the producers to the yeah, supermarkets, yeah. and they want just-in-time logistics. So, and also you have to drive to perhaps some supermarkets. So, yeah. So. They, they they push the lorry because actually that serves them better than the railway. So it's not simply about the motor car. It's about actually the the lorry will is seen as a vehicle of economic growth and of economic development and of this you know serves people's needs, wants and desires. Mm. Yep. Um, <coughs> right. Let's see where we're at. So we've gone. Just check my slides. Right. For anyone who's interested, we might come back to this. In fact, no, we will come back to this. Remind me to come back to that slide. Um, so you talk about HGVs. Uh, this is a, an image I nicked straight out of your thread on beaching, which is very good, actually. I'd recommend people go and have a look at it. Um, I might, I might um, caveat some of that. Some of the things I've, yeah, but uh, yeah, go look at it. It's a good thread. And, and I think you were talking about the off, you're, you're diminishing the idea that the offloading of um, HGVs from the, the, the state to the private sector made any difference because actually. Well, it, they it, didn't it, manage to buy up almost you know it was how do you buy up from lots of small companies they didn't manage to do it yeah, so, yeah. I mean, but also the flip side of it sometimes and I've, I've suggested this in the past i don't do anymore that actually this the the the, 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 the hgv sector benefited all of a sudden from a load of people from a load of uh road vehicles that had been previously military vehicles well actually that's not necessarily um, oh well, so so this is this is I have a ex, this is after the first world war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a uh, something you'll read any other book on my shelf behind, and I'll say it. But I have a student who I really need to, need to badger them to go and publish this. That says actually that's a bit of a, a bit of a myth. Yeah, she yeah. given the number down of how many were sold, and it becomes like a rolling ball. Oh really? Right. Okay, yeah. At, at excess capacity in the production sector, not this sell off. Yeah, yeah. But Motor vehicles, you see this in the brewing industry. We've talked about brewing before. Motor vehicles are seen as the future at the First World War. And I've got this great quote, quote from a brewer. Because so brewers were much more... We don't go into breweries a lot. But they were much yeah, more... We've done this one. <laughs> uh, the motor vehicle being a utility, the lorry, because it's, there's no unladen weight. So yeah. you're, you're sending out beer full and you're bringing it back. Um, you're bringing back empty, so it's continually economically employed. Unlike yeah. if you, you know, just delivering a product and you come back with nothing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is, there are conversations in the, the, the World War One era, just before. It's not a matter of when the motor lorry comes to dominance. It's sorry, it's not matter if. It's matter it's of matter when. when. Yeah. Um, right. So here's another picture. Now. Uh, Points. Wow, you've done some work there, like. I put some work in. Yeah, this, this, these are almost not all, but almost all of the transport ministers since the Second World War, actually. Um, so yep. you can see, uh, as Marples is number four in there, but he, so his predecessors, the, both of his predecessors had initially. In fact, the guy who's looking kind of suave um, in a sepia photo, the second one in, he initiated the motorway building program, I believe. On a national scale, which one? Oh, no. the um, boy carpenter. Yes, I think it's um, carpenter. He, he, he convinced the, the 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 government of the need for it, maybe the treasury, uh, and he he was only he wasn't there for a long time. The chap after him there was four years, and he was an evangelist for road building. Mm. So, yeah. It's these chaps who are actually to not to blame. That's the wrong word. And again, it's that thing when you've got so many people being able to afford to buy cars for the first time, especially as this 
incomes rise and they lower down the spectrum, it becomes a political win. Yeah. If you yeah. you know congestion. So the reason I. So the reason I put this up is because generally it's the people in the top line that often get maligned about closures. But as we've already talked about, this was just the way Britain was going. So actually, yes, in hindsight, it's frustrating that we've had all these closures. But actually, this is, we cannot blame, we cannot necessarily blame the, the ministers of the time because it was just the way the world was going. But also, However, they were trying to. They were trying to. De- they were trying to deal with this problem, which they had no well, capability. Benefits are one. We have the benefit of hindsight here. We can be. We can get upset that that lots of railways were closed in the past. We can get upset that the line that the the, the line of route was not protected on all these lines. We can get frustrated at this, but this is not useful energy from a sustainable mm-hmm. transport activism perspective. The people who you can legitimately get angry with are probably all of the ministers on the third line in this slide. So these are the late stage um, Thatcher uh, and uh, not just Thatcher, sorry, but the late stage um, major uh, transport ministers. And then, of course, the Blair transport ministers, who I think are probably the biggest villains of the piece because they're a new Labour government and transport was just not touched through that period. Anyway, well, we're not going to talk about that in great detail because I just, think we just can... to qualify that there mm. goes, if you take Prescott's Transport two thousand, it's it's a it's quite an ambitious idea to, to do a holistic, but it's overtaken by things like the petrol um, the petrol uh, uh, the, the cost prices, the protests, and so, it was dropped and disappeared. Yeah, very so what you've got the, of course the debate between number ten and and, and, and number eleven it's sort of taken over by, shall we say, a pragmatic trying to balance all the interests policy. Yeah, yeah there's very much a preoccupation during those years. And and as we're going to go on to the next, so you can, so we were going to play um, Cluedo on this and see if you, can, if you can name them all. How many people can people name in the chat? A few. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm seeing a few names thrown around. Yeah, I see a few names thrown around. Well, maybe people can, people can screenshot this um, and send us, and, and you get prizes if you name all of them. I mean, the reality is you just go on Wikipedia and find that they're all their names, but, you know, maybe I'll dish out prizes anyway. I'll dish out mm. points on Twitter. Um, right, so we've got this, this reduction in network size, but I wanted to contextualise this with, OK, if we're going to find a villain, so we've, we've decided that these two, much as they get maligned and blamed, aren't, the, aren't necessarily the villains of the piece, um, that actually... A lot of these ministers, as we've said, are beholden to the politics of the time. At what point is there a threshold where we do know better? So we've talked about the fact that hindsight's a wonderful thing. What is the threshold at which we do know better? And that is what this slide is about. And this is a slide that I took from when I was talking about the skills gap in electrification a couple of years ago, or a year ago. Um, so this is my timeline for where we do know better and where we do know that the motor car isn't perhaps the future. 1979 is when the World Climate Conference, is basically the first meeting of the WMO describing the idea of, um, it's the first uh, real structure where the WMO suggested that climate change is a thing that mankind, humankind, uh, mm. is influencing. And then 1988, I think, is the first meeting of the IPCC, so the International Panel on Climate, uh, panel on climate Change, a UN panel, I think, isn't it? Um, even Thatcher in 1990 makes a pretty rowdy, rousing speech about the idea that we need to stop, you know, we need to start reducing emissions and start uh, doing something about avoiding uh, catastrophic climate change. And then I think in 1996, the EU then make, a, make some sort of, they start <laughs> legislating for the idea of, man, uh, of human-made. I mean, I'm quite, I have to say man-made climate change, let's face it, it broadly is man-made, not human-made. But um, human uh, influenced climate change. So there's a timeline of us knowing better. So you could certainly say by 1990, we should have known better. And by that point, we should have started really investing in railway infrastructure. And OK, to certain, in certain things we do, but not, not on a massive extent. And, and Thatcher is still proposing massive road building programs at that, that, at that point, although they'd, by that point, they'd started petering out again. But in any case, we were still building roads. In 1994, the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, a very important Royal Commission that was entirely disbanded by uh, David Cameron's government, um, they released their report, Transport and the Environment. And they have this sentence 
uh, they, this is well, they, this is broadly their conclusion. I don't know if you know about this one, David, but I think it's quite an interesting. No, I'm not. Sentence. I'm not. I personally, I'm. What's you get? I'm not familiar with that one, but it it, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. It's the same. So the, yeah, the Department for Transport, or the Department, has failed to provide this country with an effective and environmentally sound transport policy. So that's 1994. Oh yeah. So so, that, so that's a really so that's hmm. quite cutting, and that's 94. So by 94. We, there's no excuse for us not to be doing better things with public transport policy. So I'd say that the threshold is probably around about the early 90s, where you move from, we're a product of, you know, of, of public whimsy and understanding. For a report like this to be coming out, the, the dial is turned, you know, the, the, the opinion is starting to change, and you, different things should start happening. I mean, if you apply that same logic to Beecher, if you start thinking, well, this should have been better, I I wonder, and I'm going to say this as I wonder, you know, again, environmental policy is very much determined by, you know, it's shaped by factors beyond the po the politics that are sometimes more more important, and it's when people's consciousness gets. Up, up, you know, if you when when was Swampy? Uh, it was early nineties, wasn't it? With uh, or, was it, or mid nineties even with yeah. uh, with the we have a, was it Twyford we have Down? Swampy. Was it Twyford yeah. Down Swampy? Yeah. So, but either way, this is being forced onto the political agenda. In the decades previous, um, it's it's it, how many people were genuinely concerned in the street about it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is a whole different conversation there about, sort of, you know, about how transport policy is, is effectively the politics of consumption yeah, yeah. and is, is about how we consume things and how we conserve things. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of what we, the, the, the current transport policy is, is you know, like environmental policy, is always going to be shaped by popular opinion and, and how people feel about, you know, various issues and, and how 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 powerful was that as an idea, environmentalism, amongst the average general population. Yeah. I so, can't tell you about that, but I would be interested to know. Yeah, so as an exploration of, of that, uh, so, so we've got 1994, uh, and so we're going to look at UK reductions in CO2 uh, from 1990 to 2018. So this is my lifetime. Um, and hopefully this is interesting. So this looks across sectors, I think. So in that period, we've had a reduction of energy carbon emissions of 60%. Industry, industrial output, uh, kind of industrial carbon emissions of 50%. Business carbon emissions, 40%. Residential is quite a bit lower. You know, it's, it's, 15, you know, it's 15, 16%. Um, and actually hidden behind our faces, hopefully this still works, if I go presentation with no face, hidden behind our faces is transport. And in, since, basically there has been no useful reduction in transport's carbon emissions mm. si since just before that report, but certainly since that report, no reduction in carbon emissions. And you can see that by sector, you can see this little graph. If I bring you back, there we are. Um, UK CO2 equivalent emissions by sector. You can see that this is, um, so the numbers are a bit small there, but basically pink is transport. Everything else is reducing quite a bit. Transport is just bouncing along with basically no change whatsoever, which is rubbish. Hmm. Um, so if I flick this to, right, so an important comparison is you look at the modal share, the issue with those emissions is road, um, because it's the fact that rail has a tiny modal share. Ten percent of transport is is via rail. Road is 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 the best part of ninety percent. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because in 1994, all those ministers had basically they were getting all the evidence they needed to see that new things needed to happen, and new things didn't really happen. New things have not happened. Um, right. So if I go back to this, that, and we're going to talk. That's, of course, sorry, Gareth. That's no, all gone was tempered by the, the car is great as a symbol of the you know 90s uh, of status of mobility of independence it's about all those ideas that people value 
in, you know the car is, is early it's not sim you know they could have acted but it, it that electoral pressure is so high uh, you know road usage is considered now now it's kind of changing we we are we are seeing people being more skeptical about the motor yep, car yep. um but it, it's still it remains one of those things whereas if your boiler improves if your industry improves it's it's sort of not so bound up in that sense of you know if your interest industry improvement you know reduces it so i think i think you actually transports the hard one whereas personal and commercial stuff is a bit easier um yeah so so conscious of time because we've already smashed an hour which I, I kind of plan not to happen as i always do um people have pointed out in fact ben uh, ben mole uh sorry if i'm pronouncing your name your last name wrong has pointed out that actually those those reductions in in CO two emissions are largely because we've exported all of our CO two emissions to China. Yeah, it's a point I make quite regularly on Twitter. When people oh, really? so people go, oh Britain, there's no point in us changing up, reducing our carbon emissions because we're always going to be less than you know China. They're going to create and India. They create so much emissions. That's only because throughout the latter, latter half of the twentieth century, we exported all of our manufacturing to China, and they use they burn coal to do it, to generate all their electricity. So we have exported all of our manufacturing, large, you know, large volumes of it, all the things that say made in China on them that I'm surrounded by here, all of that has been generated using the most grotty form of coal possible, exported from Australia, burned in China. So yes, I agree, we, we can make a massive difference. Um, but that's a digression. So I've come back to, um, come back to this graph because I want to explore this, this, success is the wrong word, but I want to explore the, 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 the kind of what happened du during and after the, the reduction in railway mileage, the railway network mileage. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got two trends here. On the green trend is passenger density. So that's how many passengers are uh, per, the railway is carrying per kilometer. So how many people are all shoved up together, stood on the railway line, if you like, um, being moved around. And that's mm -hmm. in um, that's how many thousand passengers per kilometer. Um, and on the right hand side, the blue trend is the per capita daily distance traveled in kilometers. So you can see in the 50s, uh, we've got around about two kilometers for everyone in the country. Um, we've got about two kilometers a day being traveled. Now, the reason I use these trends is because they take account of population change. And they take account of the network chain, the, the reduction in network uh, length as well. So actually what you have here is quite a nice way of looking at, independent of network length and independent of population, what the trend is for traveling. Mm -hmm. So you can see that actually there's quite a steady, despite the closure of all those railway lines, you don't see a massive leap in passenger density that you might expect if everywhere was pulling its weight in terms of the number of people traveling around. So there's quite a steady rise through the 20th mm -hmm. century. And actually that makes more sense from, a, from an economic perspective. In fact, some of those dips generally, in fact, all of the dips you can see, the big spikes there generally coincide with, let's bring your face back, by the way. Uh, let's bring you back. Hello again, David. Hello. Oh. Um, yeah, the, so th those dips coincide with uh, recessions. So mm -hmm. that those drops coincide with recessions. Other than the recessions, you can see there's actually just quite a steady trend of people traveling more. I think I think uh, one of the things that again I'm going to keep going back to him because as I say it's not it's 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 uh, it's, it's, it's worthwhile reading Charles's work. Um, he says he suggests, if I recall, that actually the network gets to a, a much better size for what we needed to do. Yeah. Uh, of course, there were, were a lot of a lot of lines that were duplicates. Yep. And there were a lot of lines. The Grand Central Railway is an interesting case. Perhaps we could have used some of it. I'm, I'm not a rail you know, expert today, but even when it was built, Sam Fay went to control the Great Central. He went to be general manager, and the director of the company he was working for, London South Western, advised him against it on the basis of, I'm their banker. I know they will go bankrupt. <laughs> yes. So... There's a lot of duplication uh, of lines, and another academic, uh, Mark Casson. I'm not sure I, you know, that the methodology is is it's open to a lot of criticism. But he suggests that if all the places served in 1914 had been 
served with the optimally efficient, and there is the problem, mm. optimally efficient network, um, a different network would be built which would have been, in terms of mileage, something like 8,000 miles less. So you would have served everywhere that was served in 1914 with 8,000 less miles and uh, cost a, a, th a quarter less capital. Yep. So that, for me, doesn't necessarily prove that there was... It does, in all cases, that there was excess. Yeah, and uh, the, the network... retrospectively very easily. No, the network was built in, a, in, in just a frightening sequence of chaotic surges with it very was. little strategic well sorry very little any strategic planning whatsoever not really no um the problem with that well there is one point in the mania where uh, there is a, a committee called the five kings where they make recommendations to parliament based on plan the mania was a, a speculative bubble in the 1840s this is the uh, dissolved because it clashes with some mp's interests uh but the notion that the state wasn't intervening is, is kind of a bit problematic because if you had two or three lines on the same area, there would be a parliamentary hearing to decide which ones. But these were taken independent of anything else that was going on. But also, if you think about some of the early railway promoters, we're digressing a lot here, hmm. but if you think about some of the early railway promoters in terms of what they wanted to do, say, you know, Liberal to Manchester, or London, uh, London to Southampton, or London to Bristol with the Great Western Railway, in terms of the directors, which were usually merchants and tradespeople who wanted transport links, it made sense to be connected between these places. It's only later when you get a lot of films that it becomes, a, you know, the mania particularly, and then, you know, a bit later on, uh, that it becomes a bit more, well, do you really need a railway line there? But then a lot of early lines are also built to avoid major towns. So, yeah, yeah could it be built better? Yeah. Yeah, the railway network is a mess. And, and this is where the, the rail matter on better crane easting is going to come in, where I say, stop talking about reopening railway lines. Just stop it and start thinking about where new railway lines that might happen to follow former railway line routes, where new railway lines would be useful. We need to get yeah. out of this framework, which is where... So this, this graph hopefully is quite useful because it shows, it shows a few interesting <laughs> things. It shows, um, firstly, that uh, there is a very obvious and sudden increase, and it's not because of privatisation. It's because of wider, the wider thing, again, wider context of what's going on in the UK. People have more disposable cash. Um, yes, there's a level of environmental consciousness, but actually the rate of urbanisation accelerated through the 90s rapidly. You know, London's... Uh, redu reducing population reverse, for example, London's population, the centre of London, or within the M25, basically, that population had been reducing, or certain, sorry, within the the core of London. So you know, uh, the, the 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 actual city of London and the the wider area around it, but the core city mm -hmm. area, um, the population was reducing, and it reduced through the 50s, 60s, right the way through to the early 90s, I think, and then that that trend started reversing, and I think a lot of the the and that happened in a lot of our cities. Formerly, you had a depopulation of the centre of our cities, and that reversed in the 90s. And that really is the reflection of, you know, public transport works best in cities. That is, the, is broadly where this ra rapid acceleration comes from, not from any kind of radical restructuring of the railways. Because let's face it, the railway in 1993 and the railway in 1998 look pretty much exactly the same. Uh, mm. There is not some radical change that passengers noticed. Um, anyway, right, so we're going to flip forwards to, no we're not because I need to click this boot on, flip forwards to the, the yep, lovely, the, the, this, no, you've seen all these, lovely, this is a really pro one, isn't it, you know, this, this is the conclusion. Stop referencing beaching. <laughs> stop referencing beaching. So for everyone on the feed, stop referring to beaching when you talk about the reduction in the UK's railway network. And even stop pining over the fact that we, well, we can pine over the fact that we reduced our railway network. Um, there's a lot of We've talked about this, and maybe there's another another one to discuss. But there's there's probably a lot of, nost well, there is a huge amount of nostalgia wrapped into this idea of beaching, which is what I, the Conservative I, Party are currently tapping into with the with the news that we put at the start. There's a lot of nostalgia, a lot of feeling of pining for empire, all these sorts my, of my, weird my, things wrapped into it. I was re again I, for the last, probably last time I get a reference, Charles, but in his book he makes a very good point. One of the things that there are two things. There is a strand of English thought, which very much sees the, the branch line as, as part of a, should we say, a, 
idealized rural aesthetic. But there's also an idealization of the pre-World War II uh, period when you've got Mallard, you've got Coronation, Scott, you know, you've got all these wonderful trains that by the standards of the time are actually internationally behind the times. Yeah, or, they're the yeah. past, yeah. Whereas the period of the railways after is seen as a period of decline for the railways but you move forwards to the 70s you've got the world's fastest high-speed tra- uh, diesel train you've, you've got, got the APT, the technological you've leaders. got intermodal freight that beaching actually introduced you've actually got point, some really modern stuff going on yeah yeah palpable feeling about you know about that period as one of decline of the railways actually you can point to some fantastic technological advances and that contrast is, is interesting to think about and, and, and unpack. Mm. And we touched on it a little bit. Well, I touched it a little bit on the APT episode about some of the, some of the things that, that we think about at that period. Um, uh, David Shepard asked, does reopening a beach and railway make planning permission easier? Um, so, yeah, using former track bed does make a lot of things easier. It doesn't just make the legal process easier in, in some cases, but not all. Um, but it also makes it a little bit easier when you're dealing with locals particularly long, long-rooted uh, locals, uh, because if there's been a railway there before, it's, it's a little bit easier to convince them that, that there ought to be a railway there in the future. Um, yes, so... Yes, so there's... I mean, I mean we're, we're going to talk about railway lines that ought to be reopened. No, mm. we're not. We're going to talk about new railway lines that happen to be on a corridor where all railway lines are on the Crane East episode, and I'm sure on much more episodes yeah. in the future. And in fact, I, I, pitch, I, me, pitch me your Rail Natter episodes for things you think ought to have railways that don't, and, and you can join us on a Rail Natter and talk about them. But One of the things I always love is this argument, why didn't they keep the railway lines? Why didn't they, you know, why didn't they preserve the track beds? Well, firstly, if you sell a lot of stuff on it, it recoups quite a lot of money. Yeah. Um, a, lot and of, actually, a lot of rolling stock was paid for in British Rail days by selling off bits of land. Some of them railways, some of them railway triangles, some of them bits of yeah. stuff that the railways owned that didn't do anything with. I mean, it, it, it's quite interesting that uh, after the Labour government got in in '64, um, the, the 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 they convinced Beeching to hold off selling off. He was still uh, chair of the British Railway Board to, to convince him to stop selling off certain bits of you know line but only delaying it because he wanted the money back yeah. but um if you close a branch line that's served by 15 uh, it, it, you have a train where each day there are 15 people going each way and then you try and i'm going to say try to provide a bus why do you need the track bed well that's the thinking of some people at the yeah. time yeah. and you, you can you understand it if it's the past if, what you, use you have you got for that land yeah, what what now, use is that land for you? Yeah, this is at a point where the the uh, the Depart- Ministry for Transport time horizon goes up to about 1980. Their projections of road usage are exceeded dramatically in the by the mid 60s. So, if you've got incomplete information and modelling, anyway. So I'm diver- digressing. Here. No, it's 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 fine. I, I'm, and we're all. We're all right time-wise if we're in for the hour and a half, which is invariably what's going to happen. Um, so the whole conclusion, and hopefully it's one that David agrees with, because, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want this to be me putting words in your mouth. This, you've joined as a useful historical um, context to my ranting and railing. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Dr. David. Hey. Railing. Hey. Um, but I want the thing that I want everyone who's watching, and, and, and it, this includes people who watch later, hello to you, and people listening on the podcast, hello to you as well. Stop referencing beaching, Okay. Stop it. Stop okay. it. Is that and, your talk, last word, and, and shout at anyone who doesn't. Right, no. That's that's so, so um, that, that, oh, oh that's the book, people. Wait, okay. let me get you side by side. Here he is. So that that's the book. Last round. Now he's got an academic book which is a bit denser. Um but that one is you could probably get it for pennies somewhere. And uh, it's really worth the read, and it's really great. And Charles is a great. He does. I don't think he's an academic anymore, but he he does some really great work there. Mm, yeah, it's worth reading up on it. And so, so the conspiratorialism, much as I know it's easy and nice and satisfying and feels nice to play into it, doesn't really stand up to historical mm-hmm. scru- scrutiny. Um, there yeah, were bigger I mean, things at play. There are, there are, I'm not just drawing on Charles' work, it's Terry Govich's work and Dudley and Richardson's. Why does policy change? Um, but 
I think Charles is, is, is the latest research on this. So exactly. So uh, now, what am I going to? What we're going to do? We're going to get back to get back to this. Oh, the standard stuff. Yep, we're on. We're on the podcasting platforms: iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and the the blocky one. Um, yes, I do need a QI klaxon video with the word beaching on it. Thanks, uh, thanks, David. So um, th- for everyone who's listening, hopefully we described what was on screen um, reasonably well. If we didn't, then uh, shout at me on Twitter. Uh, oh, so next thing. So some, some plugging of Dr. David Turner's stuff. Firstly, we, I know you've got Mike Esteban on next week. Esbester. Esbester. Well, where have we got Esteban from? Sorry. Mike Esbester is on next week. Yes, he is. And I, so I couldn't find his picture, so I put our one up. From okay, so um, Mike's going to be coming on, uh, and he's, gonna, he, he's doing some work on railway worker safety, um, and especially sort of before the Second World War. He's a historian of health and safety culture and health and safety and, you know, regulation development. But he's focused on the railways and he's going to be on on Monday on my show just yeah. talking about his project. Mm, which should be brilliant. Um, and if you want more of me and Dr. David Turner uh, chatting, and but also with more drinking because we drank on Monday. Uh, we haven't drunk anything tonight. What a disappointment. Uh, then also you can re-watch the episode that we did earlier in the week as well. Um, yeah, well, yeah. So so there's so there's lots of transport history chat to be had. Um, I'm looking forward to the mic one. I think that'll be really good. Also, as went live at seven o'clock this evening, yes. is this? So, so I, I my my good colleague uh, Emma Wells. She teaches two. So I teach the MA in railway studies with the University of York. Still spaces available, people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Emma teaches the postgraduate diploma in parish churches and uh, the MA in building. Uh, English Builders History, so she's an architectural historian, ecclesiastical mainly, and she, she worked, she'd worked on pilgrimage. But she and I decided to pick that one spot, which is in the Venn diagram of our yeah, academic exactly. interests, which is uh, ecclesiastical, uh, the ecclesiastical architecture and bits in railway posters, and that's up on my YouTube channel. That's a bit like this. That's just a chat where mm. we look at stuff and point at things and talk about it. It's like I like I like chats where people point at things and look at stuff and chat about it. It's good. Um, so as ever, if you want to have a say as to what rail matter themes they're going to be, well, you can suggest rail matter themes to me on Twitter. Make sure you use the hashtag. I can follow those suggestions and I, I write them in a list. But if you want to prioritise which ones appear next, then you need to follow me on Patreon because that's where you can get a link to the spreadsheet which has all the future proposals in it and and people vote and all sorts of stuff. So that's where you want to be. Uh, but you can also chuck me pennies to allow me to keep doing stuff like this in other forms. Um, next week, very much like very. I think yeah, it should be a fun one. Uh, Who's this Jeff Marshall? Chat? I don't know. Jeff Mar- is a just some 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 guy. So he's you know. a guy. I've heard of him. I think. I think yeah, he, he does a couple of things here and there. I think uh, Jeff Marshall is going to be joining us for a real matter, talking about all things underground. Um, Am I going to add a link to Dr. David Turner's YouTube channel uh, is what I've just been asked by David Shepard. Uh, you can find it on Twitter fairly easily. Um, just but also I'll, I'll link it underneath. There. Yeah, search Dr. David Turner on YouTube. You'll find him. Um, anyway, so Jeff Marshall off of uh, many stations, all the stations, is going to be joining us, which should be fun. Uh, Jeff and I haven't met before. We've never chatted before. We've, tw- tw- we've DM'd each other a few times. So that should be, it should be nice to meet Jeff. Um, so that, that should be fun. Uh, and I think the chat will go crazy and we'll probably have a lot of people watching because I know that Jeff has like a religious YouTube following uh, talking of ecclesiastical things. So anyway, that should be fun. Uh, <laughs> so uh, all that remains really is for me to say thank you so much, Dr. David Turner, for joining us this evening. Um, well, this was as much chaos as I expected to be. You, uh, as, a, as you said, a friend of the uh, channel, I should come back and... Uh... We'll find, something else yeah, some. find. We've got. Well, I did one of the. I've decided stupidly to do these weekly, which means that. <laughs> when, at what point do I run out of thoughts? Nice. I could. Yeah, at some point I have to we'll take. Maybe for Christmas. Yeah. I much prefer being the guest actually, just as an observation. But never mind. Yeah, it's it, the Yeah, it's it's it just feels frenetic when you're running it because there's stuff going on everywhere. My new desk yeah. will help. I need to get a new monitor. Anyway, 
I, this has just been... A, this was the, the first of probably quite a few beaching episodes. We're going to get more beaching people. Andrew White's going to join us to talk about beaching um, in a few weeks as well. That should be fun. Mm. Uh, everyone, thank you so much. It's been so fun. Dr. David Turner, it's just a joy. You're a friend of the show and a, and a good friend. Uh, and I'm looking forward to escaping so we can actually have real beer together. Uh, yeah. it's, it's real beer, but it doesn't look like... It, 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 we need to be in the same place and buying it from the same bar. Oh, Your oh. tap. From the yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, all that remains is to say is to say cheerio, Cheer, cheerio everyone, okay. cheerio, bye.